Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is a woman who is a remarkable person with a remarkable name. And here she is in person, Nika Wagner. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today here on Talking Germany. Pleasure. Pleasure with me too, yeah. Wonderful. Now, Nika Wagner has, since the beginning of the current year, been the director of the Beethoven Festival that takes place annually in the former German capital Bonn. She is also the great-granddaughter of Richard Wagner, Richard Wagner, who was, of course, one of the greatest and most controversial composers of all time. Nika Wagner, you have a remarkable story to tell. And as I said at the beginning, you have a remarkable name. And I'm going to begin with your name. Nika Wagner, n your first name, Nike in the English diction, the Greek goddess of victory. Yeah? My sense is that you perhaps wish that you had had a different first name. Yes, already when I was a child, I didn't know what it meant, but it has a harsh sound, Nike. I didn't mm. like it. Mm -hmm. Later on, um, I thought it was maybe not the right moment to be uh, named, baptized on the name of the Greek goddess of victory. No, you in were June, born in 1945. In June, 45. Yeah. There's, uh, there's something to mitigate the whole thing is that my father was a fanatic of Greek, ancient Greek culture. Yeah. And my sisters are called Iris and Daphne. Mm -hmm. So we, we kind of make a row, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. But and later on, I asked my mother uh, when I was really uh, an adult already, what did you think naming me Nick at the mm -hmm. time? They didn't really think much. Ah. She said, they, we didn't really think we liked the name, the sound of the name. Mm -hmm. And I mean, things have to become better one day. Okay, that's your first name. I was name. never very happy with my first name. Okay, it's interesting. Unless, now I'm Nike, unless I saw it from the Nike, from the sports uh, branding. <laughs> exactly. So now I can be relaxed. You can be re relaxed. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you about Nike. <laughs> uh, let's talk about your, your family name. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if people in our, in our audience know, but Wagner is actually quite a common German name. But in your case, you come from the Wagner family, the descendants of Richard Wagner, the, 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 the gigantic, troubled, troubling German composer. Yeah, And um, I know that somewhere you said that having the name Wagner has been for you a bonus. But somewhere else, you said you think that because uh, people would say to you when you were a child that you think because your name is Wagner, you're somebody special. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah? What's you know what's is, is it a bonus or a burden? Yeah, as you know, it's always both. As a child, this kind of uneasy situation at school was not uh, was not very agreeable. You think you're something better because you're of this Wagner family. Well, you get used to it and. A uh, funny thing is, I lived a lot abroad in France, uh, in, in America, in England. And the first thing people say when you're being presented, uh, she's called Nike Wagner, they always think immediately that you're part of this particular family. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It cannot be otherwise, yeah. because that's the only Wagner name uh, one knows. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it is an advantage in the whole. Of course, on the social level, things are going easier. Yeah. I do not have to prove something all the time. You can always get me invited without a gentleman. You can always <laughs> invite me alone. You know what that's, I mean? That's on an the interesting social thought, level, yeah. On the social level. Uh -huh. Women, otherwise, yeah, you have to justify yourself by okay. something. But if a woman comes as a Wagner, she can yeah, come on her own. You can <laughs> invite me like this without okay, any accompanying uh, gentleman. Fascinating. Yeah? Nika Wagner, let's go back to your very early days. You mentioned that you were born in 1945, the year of Germany's capitulation. And the years that followed that, the immediate post-war years, that was a time of great, great hardship in Germany. What can you remember of that hardship? I always wish to have some chocolate. <laughs> it's very simple. Really? It's very simple. Did you never get the chocolate when, uh, that you wished for? No, American soldiers just threw them. We were in the street as children. Yeah. They 
gave us some chocolate. So this is very, very how long? Simple. How long in your life did you have to wait until you got the chocolate that it's, you yearned for? Uh, you know, with the so-called Wirtschaftswunder. Yeah, the economic miracle. Yeah. <laughs> so things uh, got better. <laughs> no, I hardly survived as a child. As a yeah. baby, I hardly survived, mm -hmm. which makes me quite tough uh, nowadays, yeah. you know? Yeah. And um, no, but if you're... If you're amidst a big family, mm. um, you don't realize the social misery around you it's so well, much. You, you have described your childhood as happy and very stable. Yes. That surprises me because, I mean, the, you know, the, yes. the house, the famous house, yeah. Varnfried, that you were growing up in, had actually been sort of hard hit by, it was a ruin. It was a ruin, mm -hmm. yeah, but um, we were um, in a kind of resort house for a while where, where I was born mm -hmm. at the... Lake Constance, I think it is in England. Yep, yeah. And when I was about three years old, I, we went back to the destroyed Villa Warnfried. Mm -hmm. But you see, the benefit of misery is that families are close together. Mm -hmm. This is why my memories, and I was the third child from four, my memories are quite happy. We were all close together. Much later, my parents uh, were, uh, especially my father, he went out to, my, to work at different theatres, so this was kind of splitting up later. Yeah. But this kind of stable feeling has to do with, with the beginnings of a work and the re-establishment of the Bayreuth Festival. And it was, yeah, like in many other families, uh, close together. And wh how early did you as a young person realise that you were growing up in an extraordinary family? Your, your, your great-grandfather was Richard Wagner, your great-great-grandfather was Franz Liszt. That must have, at some stage you must have recognised that this was no ordinary family. No, uh, you grow up in this family, you find everything quite normal. Uh -huh. First signals are at school when they say, do you think I, you're, you're something better because your name is Wagner? This is the first kind of dis uh, distance signals. And much later you, you begin to realize who was Richard Wagner, mm. what are the good parts of him, what are the bad parts, and what kind of heritage is it. And for this kind of reflection, it helped me a lot to be abroad. It's much more difficult. All my, all my siblings, they mm. stayed in Germany. I was mm. the only one who went out. I was abroad constantly. So and this helped a lot to see things from outside. Tell me a little bit about your, your father, Wieland Wagner, mm -hmm. who was uh, the grandson of Richard Wagner and uh, a remarkable man. I know you loved him dearly, but I think quite, quite a sort of a difficult father, possibly. I don't think so. He was a marvellous father because you could identify with him, with what he did uh, kind of uh, in the arts at the Festspielhaus and this kind of uh, revolutionizing uh, the whole system and being against the whole old Wagner tradition, the Nazi tradition included, was very helpful. So this gave me a sense of, uh, and when I, when I, all my opinions of the arts are still colored mm. by the impression my father as always in opposition had uh, given to us. And he was a very father who loved his, his children a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was an artist and you learn artists are a little bit different. And children recognize this and they adapt. It's interesting to see the glow mm. in your eyes when you're yeah, talking about your father. Also erotically, yeah. artists may be different from ordinary mm. bourgeois men. Okay, so that was Wieland Wagner, your father. His brother was Wolfgang Wagner, and the two of them more or less inherited the family business, Bayreuth, after the exactly. Second World War. Mm -hmm. Although there had been people who had been sort of quite angry with the Wagner family and didn't necessarily want them to inherit the mm -hmm. family business. They did. Your father died in 1966, very early, really. Mm -hmm. And at, at, at that point in time, you were then cut off yes. from Bayreuth. And my feeling is that that must have been one of the central moments in your life, mm -hmm. and a painful moment. Yeah, you're well informed. My father died, and there came a new era. His brother came to power. And it's a very general pattern. 
So the children of the former uh, chief have to to be, let's say, eliminated. They have to be. They we went they have to get out of town. Get out quite, of quite get literally. out of town. Get out of our home, Villa Wanfried, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, and he made it very difficult even to get tickets to come back to the Bauhauter Festspiele. Mm -hmm. So a new era began. I was 20 of age then. I think it was a good break, finally. But you had to reinvent yourself, I sense. We all had. I always talk, uh, when I say we, it's always my two sisters and my brother. My brothers, mm -hmm. we all had to reinvent ourselves. Nothing was natural anymore because usually our father would have taken us, uh, in, integrated us into the festival work. Mm -hmm. This would have been the normal line of life. Yeah. So this was destroyed and cut off. Wolfgang Wagner, my uncle, did this for his own siblings. Mm -hmm. A very Shakespearean thing. Yeah. <laughs> the others had to disappear. Shakespearean, Wagnerian. Yeah, yeah, the others a, had to disappear. A huge element of sort of tragedy to it. But this broadened yeah. our mind also. If you're mm -hmm. driven out, you have to make other experiences. You get more international. Yep. You don't always stick to your German <laughs> surroundings. Mm -hmm. I think, so yeah. You were creatively have, uprooted. Yes, you have to invent your own profession. Mm -hmm. And you, you have to, yeah, to deal with the Wagner family, with the Wagner image also, how it is seen abroad, with history. Okay. Nika Wagner, in that report, uh, Richard Wagner is described as a genius. Most people agree that he was a genius. Can you describe that genius for us? <laughs> Describe a genius in three words, please. No, you can. <laughs> 33 words. 333. <laughs> no, undeniable. The reception, the success of Wagner is incredible up to our days. And you're quite right. Why? Why this success? I mean, it's not the first time that this question has been posed. I, I, I try to, to, to yeah, make it short. Maybe it's the erotic and the psycho, psychoanalytical thing mm -hmm. that draws people. Because he is um, the sensualness of music undeniable. Mm -hmm. And then he has found a trick always to, to depict or to generate archetypal familiar situation. Situation everybody knows, relationship, father, daughter, for instance, mm -hmm. the farewell of Wotan uh, to his beloved uh, uh, daughter Brunhilde. Everybody is weeping in the audience, mm -hmm. you know, and he, has, uh, he, he creates conflict situation, a little bit like Shakespeare again, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, that uh, everybody knows somehow. And now he gives this music, he comes from underneath practically. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean with that? He comes from uh, yeah, underneath. Yeah, <laughs> something where you cannot defend yourself. It's a, it's a kind yeah. of suggest. It's a very suggestive music, yeah. and it's always overwhelming. Yeah, it never tries to explain the things, or it just gets you. In combination with this uh, a psychic situation, family situation. Mm -hmm. Mm. It must be something like this. Hypnotic part, is a word hypnotic, that is often used. Yeah. Yeah. Irresistible. You can't, you can't yeah. resist it, quite yeah. literally. Yeah. 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 He tries not to argue, but to convince you immediately, yeah. to overwhelm you. Yeah. It's like if you're underwater. Yeah. Sensuality is a very important Sen word. Very there, sensual. Yeah. World erotics. Thomas Mann used, uh, mm. coined this word. So it's interesting uh, to hear you. Erotic. I mean, to hear, you know, Richard Wagner's granddaughter telling me this, because I, I come from a background where, you know, Wagner's music was 100 miles away. It was, mm. it was just not part of where I came mm. from. And I could never have imagined being caught up in Wagner, being captivated mm. by it. And I have in recent years, I have so to admit. you must be yeah. able to answer this question much more than I, because well, I've I grew given up with this music, yeah. so... Yeah, yeah, true, true. I never could really uh, get a distance to yeah. it. I've given it a lot of thought, I have to say. Uh, but I've also, and there, there's the word, but... Wagner was a genius. His music is irresistible. 
and I think a lot of people agree, very relevant today, yeah? But Richard Wagner was also a rabid anti-Semite. Mm -hmm. He was a man who had many other ugly traits in his character, yeah? His music is still banned in Israel today, yeah? Uh, and you have said, nevertheless, despite all that, you have said this endless moral outrage over Wagner's character gets on my nerves. Yeah. It gets on your nerves? He has been born 200 years ago, yeah? He has left us his music, his work. And I, something is getting on my nerves that they treat him as if he were our contemporary, more or less. Yeah, he has lived in very different times. He was an anti-Semite. He hated the French also, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, he wrote down why he hated the Jews. And yeah, it's written down, you know, it's not yeah. just a saying. There's evidence, it, it's, it's concrete, a, there's evidence. it's very concrete. Yeah, yeah. so we, we must know what does it mean, anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism in mm. his time. Mm. Yeah, for an historian, we should try to uh, turn it like this. And then we must ask the question, did these ugly traits enter his works, enter his operas? And there has been arguments, arguments, research and research. Finally, it comes out, no. Because if he had wanted to show us how ugly the Jew is on stage, he would have been able to, to do this. He didn't. He didn't. There are consolations you in You know his that there works. are characters in Wagner that people do view as, as, as caricatures, that vulgar. That people do in, in, view. Yeah but they are not characterized as Jewish. Mm. So if you understand certain stereotypes, certain constellations like blonde Siegfried and the ugly dwarf and so on, you can, you are permitted, absolutely um, permitted, um, to see through these disguisement, immantlement, yeah. and uh, decipher it as anti-Semitic racist constellation. But if you're a naive opera goer nowadays, why should you? Why should you? I couldn't do it when I was a child. For us, for me, it was more fairy tale characters. Later on, you're getting educated. You know how to see through these uh, theatrical disguises. Okay, so that's the that's but, the, that's the music, and I see your line of argument. Beyond the music, there is also your family's relationship with is, the Nazis yeah. and with Adolf Hitler yeah. from what 1920 onwards, very early in Hitler's rise to power. Mm -hmm. Your family hosted and supported, and lionized and nourished mm -hmm. Adolf Hitler. Yeah, yeah. This this is a fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is um, a nationalistic, ideo German ideological heritage that comes through the late Wagner, yeah, and is given over in the family. And they were German nationalists, and this has been reinforced. They were Nationalsozialists. Mm -hmm. then. Nazis. Yeah, Nazis mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. So this is a line that comes from the late Wagner, no doubt. And um, so the interpretation of Wagner's work works also from the side of the family, where in German ideology, much more than anything else, you can interpret Wagner's works also on the socialistic level, if you want to. But they didn't. There were German ideologic interpretations that came out of the family, and, and there was the bad luck of Winifred Wagner. Uh, she was born British. Mm -hmm. And as we know, very often when you change your identity, your, your nationality, you become especially fierce. And she came to Germany at yeah, a very vulnerable phase German in her life, very early Germans, in her life, and she became more German more than German. German your Germans grandmother we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. And then she found her savior, Adolf Hitler entered, who admired Richard Wagner, uh, flirted with her certainly, mm -hmm. and gave her support. Where, where he could mm -hmm. later on, uh, later in later year, money and then public. Yeah, and this went on the after the Soldier. war. 
Yeah. yeah. And okay, the whole, uh, the German people were uh, voted for Hitler. They were all yeah, Nazis. This, so this, so this, this also sounds so. This all sounds very rational, and rational it is. I mean, this is what mm -hmm. you're saying is all mm -hmm. sort of true. But your father. Mm -hmm. sat on Adolf Hitler's lap. Your father was mm -hmm. given a car by Adolf Hitler yeah. for his, for his yeah. 18th birthday. Yeah. Your father was a member of the Nazi party. And you must like all... I'm interested in you as, a sort of, as, as somebody who's typical of your generation, not somebody from your family. You must have gone to school and been shown all the films that people were shown at German schools at the time about what happened in the concentration camps and mm -hmm. all this. Mm -hmm. And you must have made a link between your grandmother, your father, so I'll Adolf Hitler, and you. Yeah, I'll tell you where the link is. Mm -hmm. That's not really a link. We saw these films, we went to our grandmother and asked her to come along with us into the films. She could le learn something about history, mm -hmm. about whom she had been with. This is Winifred again. This is Winifred again. She said, I wouldn't go. It's all American propaganda films. So we walked out. And this was an inner break with my grandmother. Yeah. Because uh, what I tried to finish the sentence, Sorry. it was not unusual that they were Nazis. Hitler was elected, he loved Wagner, and Winifred had no, he couldn't, she, she would, would have been unthinkable that she closed her doors mm -hmm. when, he, when he rose. Yeah? We have to see it as historians also. But back <clears throat> to your link that you yeah. wanted. So there was a break. Um, we could uh, separate from our grandmother, but when we, when we were growing up, we did not think of separating of our parents because my father had gone into opposition he ha to his mother, to Nazism. He could not speak about it openly. He was too much involved, as you just told us. So his mouth was shut in a way but he acted as an artist. He did what he could in his métier on stage, purifying the scene, getting away with any old Wagner tradition, included the Nazi tradition. He, he did say, he, he, uh, he took a distance of, of the past. So we thought, well, we're on a good side. We're on the good side. There's the criminal, it's, it, it's our grandmother. Uh, it was an easy solution. It was a little bit too later. easy, the solution, yeah, though. Only I much mean, later, yeah. only much later, we learned about the facts of his natural involvement in the Nazi regime. He grew up and Hitler always came by. He was a friend mm. of the family. And then my father was a very introvert person. There was a sister, Friedland, who was not introvert who had Jewish friends, who went abroad, and she opposed to Hitler openly at mm -hmm. the time. My father did not. Mm -hmm. He was too close to his mother. He, was, he wanted also to come to power in Bayreuth, and Hitler was kind of protector of the young man. Okay. Yeah, the constellation is devilish. And the more he yeah. suffered, uh, after the war. Permit me one more question on this complex, because it's what, it is a question that I've asked myself for a long time, and I'm very fortunate to have you mm. here, and you can possibly give me an answer. There are a lot of historians who say that the Wagner family is still keeping very important documents under lock and key that historians who are trying to document mm -hmm. the period really mm -hmm. should have access to. And the question that arises from that is, do you believe that there are still mm, skeletons in the cupboard? I don't really believe that when one day um, members of my family in question here will render their documents. I don't think that this will change the image that we have of the relationship, the Nazis and the Wagners. Maybe there are two more postcards from Hitler to Winifred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I honestly, I cannot imagine that this will really bring forth things that changes again something. Okay. That's a fair you know, assessment. We will, we will have to wait yeah, and see. It might be a long yeah. time before we actually get the, the, because the truth, the, as it were. Because the evidence so. is so strong already. Yeah. If you find one or two letters more, maybe to some 
Parteigenosse some more letters of Party, Winfried. Party member. Party yeah. member. Yeah. I don't think this will change uh, the image uh, and our knowledge about the close relationship. Maybe some more details. Mm. So, Nika Wagner, you were in charge of the Weimar Festival for 10 years. You've now been at the helm in Bonn for a short period of time, but you're looking to the future. Um, I suppose an American at this stage would ask you, there's a wonderful American phrase, what do you bring to the table? Yeah, do you do, is it your name and your networking capacities, or is it more than that? I think it's more than that. Um, it is my very wishful thinking, I, I bet, to get... Um, Good programming, interesting programming, excuse me, interesting programming mm -hmm. to, to Bonn. Not only stars. Stars are wonderful musicians, no doubt. But I think you should shift also your attention sometimes to a more um, elaborate program, a more coherent program, which is difficult to realize when you engage big orchestras on tour. They have their fixed programs. Mm -hmm. But uh, what, I, what was characteristic for my work in Weimar is the kind of dramaturgical knitting together a coherent programs on mm -hmm. all kinds, in theatre, in dance, in discussion, in mm -hmm. cinema and in great music. Mm -hmm. I like to do this. I will try to realise a little bit of this in Bonn also, mm -hmm. even though um, the main main dish will be uh, the big orchestras mm -hmm. will be Beethoven, and another main dish will be the education program. Oh, yeah. This has been had been built up uh, by my predecessor mm -hmm. in a marvelous way. Mm -hmm. It's a very rich education program, yeah. and also with the help of Deutsche Welle, to, cooperating uh, cooperating, um, we could realize the big campus project. Yeah. That means not only getting our hero Beethoven out of the country mm -hmm. as a kind of ambassador of the best Germany we have, you can't do this with Wagner, mm -hmm. but also to import young orchestras from all, all sides of the world. Mm -hmm. That's a, I, I love watching youth orchestras when they're playing because they have a completely different kind of enthusiasm yes. from the yeah. professor. But let's yeah. just go back to, 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 to one of the points you were making. I mean, you're saying you're being very serious, very earnest, very intellectual, and, uh, and that's all fine. And I can imagine you come up with very good, very coherent programmes. But what, the, what today's audiences want is they want, mm -hmm. they want picnics and public viewing and entertainment, and they want, they want to be able to go home after the weekend away and say, I saw Rattle conducting, or I saw Anne-Sophie Mutter on stage, and I was there, big stars and all that kind of stuff. You have to cater for that. This, yeah, that's the mm. difficulty for all festivals, mm. for all high classical festivals today. You know, there's the popular mainstream, mm. the digi digital mm -hmm. cultures, and there's the elitist uh, high classical uh, concerts where people are getting older and older. Mm -hmm. We know about this. Mm -hmm. And a lot is being done to build bridges. Yeah, and there will be also uh, not only the educational program, but also like a, a popular channel, let's say, to this festival, uh, which is, uh, yeah, you can't get the young people otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and you need But I'm not running after young people. But you need them. Because, I mean, we heard in that report, you know, your, your audiences are ageing. When I, when I go to the yeah. opera houses here in Berlin, when I go to the concert yeah. halls in Berlin, I look around me, and I'm really glad that this state I'm living in is subsidising this art for me. Yeah. But it, the, you know, we're we're, yeah. we're sort of yeah. middle class, slightly sort yeah. of elderly people. Not, we're not 20 years old. I know. Everybody <laughs> talks about it. Yeah, it's but, a problem. Uh, but try to be an historian for a moment. It has always been like this. You know, we are we are our culture grew out of the little court cultures. They were always a minority of our, of our society. Mm. And our, t our endeavor must be today um, to build bridges to the young. And uh, a lot of them is just elsewhere. You mm. won't get them, the big popular. And the concerts, they are not designed for big uh, audiences. Yeah. yeah, there's chamber music, there's orchestral music. 
if, even if you have loudspeaker boosters, you would do harm to the music. So you can't have both. You can do what we all do, you know, the mediating business, the education business. We do much more than at my youth time, they did nothing. We were curious to know, we came. Yeah. Now we, we have to try to find them. But if there's no parental home, somewhat cultures, yeah. if there are not, nothing is being done at schools, fest, poor festivals cannot take up uh, everything that, is, that is, uh, should be done by the states or on, indi on individual levels. Although it's interesting because you're, you're, you're talking about uh, young audiences and when I, I do go to opera quite mm -hmm. a lot and I go to symphony concerts mm -hmm. and at symphony concerts I find it's still quite a sort of a stiffy, sort of uh, mm -hmm. a, a stuffy sort of above average age audience. Often when I go to the opera, it's quite interesting how many sort of people in their 20s are turning up. They find opera yeah, somehow opera sexy and much more fizzy. funny. It's much exactly. more funny. There yeah. are stories being told. Yeah. There is blood and love and whatnot. Yeah. And very often mm -hmm. the metteur en scène, the stage directors, yeah. uh, they like actual to, to transform an old plot yeah. that plays in Venice, let's say today in Afghanistan or somewhere. Mm. So this may be, they try to attract young people by, mm. act, by, by living opera, making it very mid actual references. Just tell me one thing, when you, uh, you go to Bayreuth regularly, regularly. still, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. despite the fact that you're not part of the sort of the system, the, yeah. the, the, the setup, the institution, mm -hmm. yeah? when you're sitting there, on those famously uncomfortable wooden <laughs> seats, which are very sort of <laughs> tight, yeah, yes. and uh, and it's not very well, uh, the, 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 it's not comfortable, no, yeah. But you're listening strange. to this music from your great grandfather, yeah. What do you feel? Well, I'm so at home in this house, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's, it's, it's quite natural to sit there. I know it's, uh, yeah, it's very uncomfortable. But I ask myself, why do people come? And is for the Germans uh, the pleasure in the arts or in opera, in music, in Wagner's music, is it combined to, to, to stress, to physical stress, yeah. so that you can walk out and say, ah, this was something but you don't really mean the arts, but you mean what you achieved yourself in a sportly uh, manner even. <laughs> so this is a very, very funny phenomenon because in Kleinborn, uh, you're very comfortable. Exactly. You, you have your picnics, it's, yeah. uh, everything is very human. Mm -hmm. I d but this is... <laughs> I stopped you in mid-sentence mm -hmm. there. We're going to have to leave it there. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Thank you very much for sharing all those observations with us, yeah, your enthusiasm. That is, I'm afraid, your lot with Nika Wagner. I told you that she's a remarkable woman with a remarkable story. I think you've, uh, you'll agree now. If you've enjoyed her company as much as I have, do come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss.